Spirit with Dr. Chuck Betters of Mark Inc. Ministries. Today we continue with the message from our archives titled, Trumpets and Bowls, Part 2, from the series, Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. Each In His Grip message is designed to help turn your heart towards Jesus and to equip you to walk by faith. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary. His face was like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and his legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of the multitude. And then when you jump up to chapter 12 of Daniel, he says, this man was clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river. He lifted his right hand and his left toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times and a half, and time when the power of the holy people has finally been broken, all these things will be completed. Now there is no debate as to who this is in Daniel chapter 10. There is no discussion as to who this is. When you compare Daniel 10 with this passage in Revelation chapter 10, this mighty angel can be none other than Jesus Christ. He is robed in a cloud, divine majesty coming in judgment, and you'll notice in verse uh, 1 of chapter 10 that it says, with a rainbow above his head. The rainbow is always the symbol of God's grace and faithfulness to his covenant people. And so he comes as a judge, but he comes with a rainbow. He comes as judge to judge the earth, but he comes as a, as a, as a God of grace and faithfulness for his people. He does not come to judge us. He comes to insulate and to seal us. God's grace is to his people, yet he comes with fiery feet. Fire, judgment, feet, war. He comes with, with judgment that will, will issue forth in war. And it fits the description of chapter 1 of the book of Revelation that tells us how this Christ will come again, what he will look like when he comes. And so the conclusion is, as chapter 10 opens, this mighty angel, during this interlude, who is about to say something to John, is none other than Jesus Christ. Notice verse 2. He's holding a little scroll. It lays open in his hand. His, he planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now we'll describe or define that scroll for you later. The feet here are to show that he is not now coming as a priest who intercedes for the sins of people. He is coming as a judge, as a judge who will respond to the mindset of those people who in chapter 9 refuse or still refuse to repent of their sins of idolatry. So he comes as judge, yet there is for his people in this scene marvelous wonderful grace and hope of eternal life and the promise of a new heaven and the promise of a new earth that will be restored to them. In this new heaven and this new earth, all of his restored creation will be made subject to him. That's the picture of his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This is not the priest coming. This is not the one who came as a baby to atone for the sins of his people. This is the judge to come. This is the one spoken of in Psalm 110, verse 1, where David says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, when he says, For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. This is what Ephesians 1.22 means when it says, And God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything in the church and for the church. You see, friends, we live in a time where it appears that evil reigns supreme. And as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, the church is going to be silenced more and more. And evil is going to continue to appear to have supremacy uh, supremacy, and, and it is going to continue to look as though evil reigns. But when we begin to put these scriptures together, we realize that God is in absolute control of the events of this world. That's why when you come to verses 3 and 4, it says, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. 
When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Now there has been considerable discussion over the years as to what these seven thunders are and what they said that John was forbidden to write it down. Who are these seven thunders and why is their message to be kept secret? Well, one thing you need to understand is that thunder throughout the scripture is representative of judgment. Seven is the number of completion. So there are seven specific judgments. Now, they are not seven in number, but there is a complete number of specialized judgments that God will send just prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what are they? We don't know. We're told here that they're kept secret. They're known to God. They may go undetected. We may never know what those judgments are in this lifetime. But there are judgments that God is going to send, and for no other, for a lack of a better way to put it, to ripen the world for the coming of the Christ. To get them ready, so to speak. To prepare the world for the ultimate judgment that he will bring to this earth. Seven secret judgments, or a number of secret judgments. Now, I don't know what they are. They remain a mystery. We can only conjecture as to what they are. Uh, talking to different people, you know, you, you come up with all kinds of neat theories as to what these judgments could be. Some say, well, maybe AIDS is one of them. Maybe the AIDS virus is a judgment that God has, you know, chapter 9 talks about sexual immorality as a sin that characterizes the last day. Maybe the AIDS virus, as some have said, is a judgment or a warning from God. It could be a, a uh, uh, climactic type of, of judgment, a, a judgment on the earth per se that goes unperceived. Maybe a change in weather patterns. Maybe some other form of preparation that will go unnoticed as a judgment but nonetheless is sent by God to ripen the world. But he tells John, don't write it down. Keep it a secret. And to this day it remains a secret as to what those judgments are. Then look at chapter 10, verse 5. Then the angel I had been, uh, that I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. Here we are, we're in the midst of this interlude. This interlude is designed, as all the interludes are, to send peace and comfort and security to the church, to the people of God that will find themselves in the midst of tribulation. The church is about to go through tribulation, and so this interlude is designed to give to the church comfort and peace. Evil seems to have won. The church will have been silenced. There will be no repentance. There will be no revival. Yet he who holds the scroll in his hand reigns. And this vision is to dispel all the fears, yet it is to strike terror into the hearts of men. And verse 6 says, And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea that all that is in it, and said, There will be, there will be no more delay. You see, friends, there shall be days of unprecedented sorrow, the Bible says. And I believe, as I have taught you over the months that we've studied this, that the church will go through that tribulation. We will not be secretly raptured out. We will go through those periods of unprecedented sorrow. Yet this verse tells us, as a source of comfort to us, to, to those who believe the gospel, they will come to an end. Those days will be shortened, he says. God will provide his special grace to his people to come through that time of sorrow. Those of you who have ever experienced sorrow, intense sorrow, you know, you know what that special grace is like. 
You imagine yourself having to go through something and you think, I could never get through that. I could never survive something like that. And yet, as, as, as those things happen to you, somehow or another, you make it through. Somehow or another, you survive. What is this but God's special grace? Special touch. Special ministry. This is what the angel is announcing. This is what Christ is saying. Yes, though you will go through unprecedented sorrow, though the tribulation will become intense, it will come to an end. It will not last forever. You will not feel this pain forever. God will give you that grace. Inexplicably, he'll get you through. Verse 7 says, and in those days, then the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. The mystery of God will be accomplished. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, that's to incite you to persevere. That's to incite you not to quit, not to give up. God has been faithful as he did through the prophets. As he gave that message through the prophets who came through unprecedented sorrow in their days, so he will give it to you, no matter what you may be going through. Why? He's saying to us, if you feel cheated, if you feel robbed, if you feel overlooked, if you feel as though you've been taken for granted, if you feel as though your God is silent, what is this mighty angel saying? What is this Christ saying who has one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, who brings all things ultimately under his control? What is he saying? Our God reigns. He reigns. That's the picture. That's the interlude. There's some strange instructions this angel gives in verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. He says, John, go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. This is, by the way, not the same scroll that the Lamb takes back in the second parallel section, chapters 4 through 7. This is not the seven-sealed scroll. That is the plan of redemption. This is a different scroll. It's a little scroll. You remember that first scroll that the Lamb takes that represents God's plan of redemption and salvation could not be touched by anyone but the Lamb. This one he's commanded not only to take, but to open it and to read it and to eat it. This is not the same scroll. This is a different scroll. For you see, no one was found worthy to open that first scroll. But now John is commanded to take it and to open it. But not only to open it, but verse 9 says, he says, the angel asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. Take it and eat it. And what's it going to do? It's going to turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it's going to be as sweet as honey. John is to take this little scroll, whatever it is, he is to embrace it. He is to ingest it. He is to appropriate both its promises and its warnings. For you see, in that little scroll, there are some warnings. It speaks of judgment when it talks of the beast, when it talks of the martyrdom of the saints, when it talks of persecution, when it talks of plagues and death. And these are the bitter herbs of this little scroll. And that is why when he takes it inside, when he ingests and appropriates what the message in that little scroll is all about, it turns his stomach bitter. But you see, that little scroll also speaks of grace. It speaks of victory to the overcomer. It speaks of the removal of pain and sorrow and death. It speaks of the avenging of the blood of the martyrs. It speaks of a new heaven. It speaks of a new earth. And these are the sweet fruits of life that we have in the spirit of Jesus Christ. So although it speaks on the one hand of, of judgment and warning, it speaks on the other hand of grace and promise. A bitter, sweet little scroll. 
And so he takes in verse 10 the little scroll from the angel's hand. He ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Now any Bible scholar will tell you that this is a picture of what happened in Ezekiel's ministry when God was preparing Ezekiel for the prophetic ministry. Back in chapter 2 of the book of Ezekiel, verse 8, he says to him, But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you, he told Ezekiel. Verse 3 of chapter 3 of Ezekiel, Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. You see, Ezekiel was being prepared for the prophetic ministry. And so what did God do? He said, in order to prepare for this ministry, I want you to eat the scroll, and then I want you to speak the truth. And so his message was one of woe to a stiff-necked and, and uh, unrepentant people. For that reason, the book must become a part of him, God says. You've got to feel its pain. You've got to sense its warnings. You've got to appropriate its promises. You, Ezekiel, you need to know from first-hand experience the grace of the book and the promise of the book. Then and only then could you truly face life knowing the full dimension of the sovereignty and the power that God gives to live this life out in light of those promises and warnings. So you see, in Ezekiel's case, the little scroll he was commanded to eat was the book of Ezekiel. It became a part of him. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that book was penned from firsthand experience. Now when we come to the book of Revelation, he tells them in verse 11 of chapter 10, then I was told. When was he told? After he ate the book. After he ingested the book. Now, don't be mistaken here. Don't, don't take these symbols literally. Uh, John did not have to stand up and eat paper and, and pages and, and, and chew up uh, scrolls. That's not what he's talking about. This is symbolic. In other words, he's saying to John, appropriate the message. Take the message in. The bitter part of it, the graceful part of it, the sweet part of it, and the, and the bitter part of it. Take it all in. Appropriate. And then he says in verse 11, what are you to do with it? You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. There's no doubt in my mind as to what this book is. This little scroll that he was commanded to eat, to ingest, and then to preach is none other than the book of Revelation. The little scroll is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why then are we so afraid of this book? Why then is it rarely preached? Why are its contents so obscure to us? Because you see, it is the one book that more than any other unfolds the marvelous, wonderful plan of God from beginning to end, both in its bitter dimension and in its sweet dimension. It's an outline of history and redemption from the perspective of the throne of God. And I believe it's one book Satan would not have us to read. Now, I don't believe Satan wants us to read any of the books of the Bible, but it is the one book that more than any other gives to us the events between the first and second comings of Christ. It tells us how, how this whole thing is going to turn out. It tells us how, how we're going to win. It tells us what's going to happen. It, it, it unfolds to us events that are crystal clear. And as we've studied this book so far, we've been able to see applications even to our current world scene. Snapshots, if you will, of the end times. So the interlude continues in chapter 11. And when you read verses 1 and 2, the temple, whatever that is, is measured. This is a part of the instruction. Eat the book, now measure the temple. Measure the temple. Now, friends, in order to understand this measuring process, you need to come to grips with something here. First of all, let's talk about the Old Testament concept of the city of God. 
Now, you say, why are we going to do that? Well, if you read verses 1 and 2, it says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God in the altar and count the worshipers there. And then in chapter 11, verse 2, he tells us, he says, uh, uh, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now, here is language that needs to be decoded. Here is symbolic language that to us who live on this side of Jerusalem, to those who do not understand what it means to be Jewish, to those of us who were not a part of the first century Jewish Christian community, these symbols may become very obscure. We may not un understand and comprehend them, so we need to track back a little bit further. We need to see the city of God on earth in its Old Testament setting, then in its New Testament setting, then in its future setting. Then you'll understand the measuring of the temple. So if you look back in the Old Testament, for example, Jerusalem was considered to be the city of God that represented the kingdom of God on earth. So you've got this city, a literal city called Jerusalem. And in that city resided an organic community called Israel. They all considered themselves to be, by birth, the people of God. So you have this city of Jerusalem, and its residents are Israelites who view themselves as the people of God. Yet we know that inside of the city of Jerusalem, many of those Jews... Who considered, them the, who considered themselves to be truly the people of God, sacrificed to Moloch. They were apostates in every sense of the word. Many of the people who, who were inside the city of God, the kingdom of God, so to speak, the city of Jerusalem, were apostates. They had no problem sacrificing their children to idols or worshiping to false gods like Moloch. But now as you move inside of the city of Jerusalem, you'll find in the, in the city limits a, a temple structure. On the outskirts of the Holy of Holies, there is an outer court called the Court of the Gentiles. There the people would gather. That was the gathering place. That's where the people would come. But then inside of the outer court, there was a center of worship a, a holy place, if you will, where only those who truly desire to worship God would bring the blood sacrifices and offer sacrifice for the atonement of their sins. So now what do you have here? You have a picture, the Old Testament city of God, made up of Jerusalem, where there were apostates, the outer court of the Gentiles, where the, we'll call it the show church appeared, you have the false church on the outside. You have the show church in the court of the Gentiles. And inside of that, entering into the Holy of Holies, are the people who by faith bring their sacrifices looking forward to the coming of Messiah, the Old Testament way of the blood sacrifice. A dramatic picture, if you will. The false church, the show church, the true Israelites, who desired to worship God by approaching Him and appropriating the fullness of the blood. Now when you come to the New Testament, it is called the kingdom of God on earth. Remember in, in the parables, Jesus described uh, the growth of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. In its broadest sense, the kingdom of God in the New Testament is similar to Jerusalem in the Old Testament. Inside of the kingdom of God, there are apostates. Inside of the kingdom of God is the false church. And yes, as you move into closer to the center, there in the outer court, there where the Gentiles gather, we have the show church. Today it's made up of all kinds of denominations. Certainly they do not preach the gospel of Moloch the way the false church does. They are not apostates in the, in the true sense of the word. 
and in, in our denominations and in our, our mainline movements and in, in interdenominational ministry across the earth. There is the show church, this organic community, if you will. We gather in the name of Christ. We worship in the name of Christ. We even preach in the name of Christ. But then we all know that inside of the show church, there are people truly who have been washed in the blood of Christ, truly who know how to approach the Lord in faith through the blood of Christ, truly those who are children of the living God, truly those who have been born again. In the apostate world, those who deny inerrancy, those who deny the virgin birth, those who deny the deity of Christ, yet claim to be Christians, yet claim to be the people of God. The show church that gathers together weekly, daily, all over the world. Thank you for listening to In His Grip, a ministry of Mark Inc. We just concluded part two of the message titled Trumpets and Bowls, part two from the series Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. You can download this sermon at www.markinc.org. At markinc.org, you'll find numerous free resources that offer help and hope to the hurting. You can also safely give online to help keep In His Grip on the air. Thank you in advance for your support.